Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the NAMA webinar. Uh, today, we are covering e the egos, the ecology, and the economics of truffle culture with Stephanie Jarvis. And here she is. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Hello. Okay. I'm just um, responding to Donna Kurt. She's asking me where I am. Okay. Yep, right there in the chat. That's going on. I'm just going to do a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, here, uh, we have some great forays coming up. Uh, to invite you to. We have our uh, NAMA MX in August and our NAMA Zona also in August. Just a reminder to everybody, these are high elevation forays and uh, August, the weather is perfect in these locations. It's not like you maybe think it's going to be really hot. You will need probably long, long sleeps uh, at these, especially in the evenings. And then we've got our big Pacific Northwest NAMA camp in October. That's our big annual event. Hope to see you there. We've got some fun virtual events coming up right here. You can see uh, we have a movie night next week with uh, Hamilton Pevick and Hamilton is on this on this webinar. Hi, Hamilton. Um, we are looking to do one on uh, the Bolitz with Brent Dettinger. Um, in, in March, uh, we've got a virtual book club coming up and a culinary webinar and another one on Arizona Bolitz in, in April. So some fun stuff coming up. We'll be putting those in, in, uh, on the website. I believe the, the film uh, movie night is already on our website and you can sign up for that. And we're going to release that tonight after this webinar. We'll tell the world about it. All right. Uh, and finally, moving on to the business at hand. Uh, here's here's a little bio for Stephanie. And um, I, I hate reading these bios, Stephanie. I don't want to kind of read through your, your CV here, other than to, than to note that you do have a master's in ecology and uh, evolution and conservation biology and genetics, where you studied under Dr. Dennis DeHardine. Um, uh, and also you have an undergraduate degree in mycology, plant physiology, and chemistry. That's so many more words than I have in, 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 in my Bachelor of Arts and Masters. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and I'm gonna take my screen away and you can you can load up your presentation here and, and really commence with the webinar. And I'm gonna turn my video off and just sit back and watch. Yeah, if you, yeah, and your screen share and I'll put my screen share up. Okay. Let's just do that little bit okay. of it. Okay, mine's over there so you can hop in. And then... Hold on a second. Sometimes I'm a little functionally challenged. It's all right. Get the, get, once you get the screen sharing set, yeah, you'll be okay. good to go. All right. Now we're going to view slideshow. And then we want to go to the slideshow. All right. Here we are. That's so, great. I'm going to yeah. say goodbye. Okay. Thank here you. Over here. Anything. Fabulous. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to uh, spend an hour plus with me today um, on your lunch break or in the middle of your day. Um, as Stephanie Jarvis, I am a mycologist. I studied the Lycopredaceae with Dennis Desjardins and I did an all species inventory for the state of California for my master's thesis, which is uh, in print. It's about 400 pages short. Um, and uh, so now I actually just started as a new position at M2 Ingredients, OM Mushrooms, Functional Mushrooms down in Vista, California. I'm the new director of mycology for research and development here. We have a lot of awesome projects going on in terms of functional mushrooms, but I have been growing truffles on the roots of trees for going on 15 years now. And it's been such a journey, and I am very honored that I get to um, share that with you today. I've learned so much, and so much has been learned by all of us in the truffle industry. And every year, it just becomes more and more. And so I'm going to share with you um, some of that today. So Pacific Truffle Growers is a company I started Many years ago, very uh, the short of the long is I started working with arborists and I became a certified arborist to give continuing education classes through the International Society of Arboriculture. And from that, I started graduate school studying more mycology with Dr. Desjardins. And then people in the truffle industry just started finding me organically and asking me if I can come and rehabilitate their trees. And so most of the orchards I manage are all rehabilitation projects. A few we've gotten truffles out of the ground and a lot we haven't. 
one of the biggest takeaways I've had learned is if as a consultant, if I'm only on your orchard once a year, I cannot grow you a truffle, especially if you don't go out and spend time in your orchard. So with that, let's get into my presentation before I run out of time. Um, so today I'm going to talk about truffles, the egos, the ecology, and the economics, economics of cultivating uh, and hunting nature's nuggets of gold. So uh, I'm going to go over a little history. I love history and why we eat them. And then I'll talk about what are truffles, how to make a truffle and the ectomycorrhizal dynamics in the forests and, and orchards. We're trying to make a forest ecological system. I'll talk about the aromas and why we are so attracted to truffles and how this complex system gets even more complex. The more we start to learn about what's going on in the soil, then we'll talk about the egos, the people, the politics, the beasts, and that will lead me into the ecology of truffles. I'll talk about wild forage truffles, re-inoculating wildlands and reforestation efforts, the insects and the roles that they play, uh, how and where to look for wild truffles. I know a lot of you are foraging enthusiasts and are hoping to gain the magic key from me today to try to find a truffle in the forest. And I'm sorry to say there is no magic bullet there, but uh, there are clues, okay? And then I'll talk about cultivation, uh, the trees and their tubers, inoculating efforts, and then uh, go over very briefly because uh, normally I give a talk about all the farming aspects, but we're going over a bunch of other more interesting ecological things today. But we will talk about a little bit of land consideration and farming basics, the liming, the tilling, soil erosion, soil management, and all of that at the very end. And I'll give some thoughts on Christmas tree farming and other aspects of the fungi that we can manage this way. And I'll talk about the economic, the economics lastly, and how expensive and why these items really can be. So the history of truffles, the takeaway here is that it really goes back all the way to Mesopotamia. We have been eating and putting uh, truffles in boiling water and putting that water on our eyes to help us with osteoporosis or uh, eye issues and um, as aphrodisiacs for a really, really long time. Uh, Trufezia, the truffle um, from the desert in the Middle East is still very highly sought after. And it's from, step back to the beyond Roman and Greek days, it was really thought that it was from a strike of lightning in the ground that created this magnificent fungi. And there, there's an ecological role and truth to that as well. And that has to do with moisture in the soil. And going through through the Roman era, the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance, um, this is when culinary started to really be developed in Europe. And it really became this item of the aristocracy. Champagne, wine, culinary, and truffles really started to gain interest um, in the culture. Uh, in Europe. Uh, peasants started collecting truffles to bring to their local, you know, leaders in the arist aristocracy of their region. And it be, really became this um, item of clout and um, an item of a food item of vanity. This is when uh, the 19th century, when gourmet cuisine was really starting to develop. Um, oh, a little a little side note. If you put uh, questions in the Q and A, uh, Trent is going to be monitoring that and the chat. And so we're going to hold off on questions until the very end, unless there's something really burning to ask me, and he'll he'll go ahead and interrupt. But other than that, we're going to save some time for Q and A at the end. So the history of truffle cultivation is very very interesting. Um, it goes back to the early 1800s that we know of in written record. 
And, you know, with the father of gastronomy and the, the beginnings of uh, real taxonomy in terms of mycology and not just mycology, but the world as we know it. And we know that in 1847, there were 17 acres planted in uh, the southern areas of France. And from there, there was a lot of truffle orchards being planted. Um, let's see. So in the late 19th century, late 1800s, phylloxera became a real issue in the silkworm industry on mulberries and in the wine industry on vineyards. And this killed back a lot of that agricultural crops and allowed for truffle culture to really set foot in Europe. And so a lot of truffle trees, this is mostly oaks, were planted. In 1890, in the written record, over 190,000 acres, that is a lot of land planted to mainly oak trees in France, in the southern area of France. And how they were getting these trees is, you know, it's a native truffle to the area, native tree to the area. So they were going out in nature, collecting the acorns, collecting the truffles, germinating and adding the truffle. And it just is an association that just goes right together naturally. And then putting those into an orchard setting. The problem is at the end of the 1900s, uh, excuse me, the end of the 1800s, the end of the 19th century, we had the industrialization era had begun. It wasn't cool to live on the farm. Kids were growing up and moving into the big cities to work in factories. And then we had the World War I and World War II. And unfortunately, with those two wars, a lot of men passed away and a lot of knowledge passed away. And a lot of uh, these truffle uh, agricultural crops were destroyed by war. And a lot of that knowledge just kind of um, left us. And those who were still growing truffles, things became secret, secret sauces, secret ways to do things. And there was a huge decline in cultivated truffles on a mass level in Europe. And today, there, you know, in the uh, mid 1900s, there was a huge um, insurgence of um, interest in growing truffles in Europe. And so Spain is a, a huge proponent uh, of this, of mass amounts of trees that went into the ground. And I'll talk about that later. In the 50s and 60s, the government saw it as a viable economic crop and started subsidizing farmers to put trees in the ground. And we're not there yet here in the United States, but they do this in other countries as well. France, Italy, Australia, and in New Zealand. And today, uh, about 80% of uh, French truffles are grown in groves in uh, orchard settings. And then also we've got them in Chile, Sweden, Tasmania, the UK, uh, Turkey, um, Africa, and now we also in South America. So really, this is a viable crop on a global um, on a global level. <clears throat> so we're going to go over just very briefly. I understand most of you probably know what um, uh, mycorrhizae are. Oh, let me go back really quick. Sorry. In um, the United States, in 1987, the first tuber melanosporum, the black paragord truffle, tuber melanosporum, came out of the ground in Mendocino County, Northern California. Uh, this was William Greiner. He was a little bit of a recluse. He was a Vietnam War veteran. I've been to his farm three times. He has unfortunately since passed away and how he was growing truffles, that knowledge has gone with him. But um, it's a very interesting method that he was growing and just from a little bit of uh, digging in the soil up there and seeing his uh, greenhouse with vermiculite and perlite gives me really good ideas of how he was going about that. He was getting trees from Francois Picard, 
who was bringing trees into the U.S. from France in an effort to start cultivating truffles here in the U.S. So we really started getting started there in the 1980s. And boy, have we grown since then. It's very exciting that I get to share this with you today. So mycorrhizae 101, what are truffles? We There are many different types of mycorrhizal fungi. Ecto, endo, what does this all mean? Basically, with the truffles, which is an ascomycete, uh, and basidiomycetes do this uh, method of getting attached to the roots as well, but it's an association. Fungus is in the soil, the trees in the roots, and they start to actually grow together. Okay, so mycorrhizae means fungus root. And the fungus, when it attaches to the root, actually stimulates the root to grow in a certain way that the fungus prefers. And in this uh, middle picture here, you see there's a lot of dichotomous branching and the fungus is actually stimulating that root to grow more branches so that it has more surface area to then uh, latch onto and, um, and be able to share nutrients and water from the soil and receive photosynthate sugars from the tree. We see this as a symbiosis, not a parasitic relationship, but sometimes we see it as opportunistic. And there is definitely an argument there that this could possibly be slightly parasitic, that maybe the fungus is getting more benefit than the tree, but we're not really seeing it as a true parasitic relationship where the plant is really getting taxed to the point of death. So um, here we see uh, the ectomycorrhizae on the left. And what you see is the mycelium goes slightly into the tissue of the root and just kind of grows around the cells, doesn't really penetrate into the cells. And what it does is it weaves like a, a little sock around the tip of the root. And um, endomycorrhizae, which is the majority of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, which are typically hypogeous below the soil, they actually go into the root and into the cells. But we're not talking about that. But there are many different strategies to, uh, to be mycorrhizal. So here's an example of this super dichotomous branching. This is, um, I believe, a ruchula species on, um, on um, a conifer tree. But just as an example, you can see the white mycelium and the super branching pattern of those um, adventitious roots. Here is a, a scanning electromicrograph, which I did a lot in my master's thesis. I love SEM photography. It's really cool. You really get down to the very fine details of what you're looking at. And I did a lot of work on spore ultrastructure, which I now do in terms of identifying truffles and other types of fungi. You have to look at the spores in fine tune detail. But what you're seeing here is a pine root and you can see the mycelium on that root has really done a great job of knitting a sock over the tip of that root. And through that, it does this exchange of nutrients, water and photosynthate sugars. So truffles are heterophallic and that means they need sexual production in order to reproduce. And um, there's different mating types. So if you wanna simplify it, you can simplify it as males and females, but it's a lot more complicated than that. And this is not a study I did. This is another population genetic study on truffles that was done. But what the takeaway here is what we're seeing is there's different phenotypes going on in the soil, which you see from the blue and the red root tips. So we're seeing different phenotypes on different types of root tips, which is different expressions of enzymes in the fungi. And then out freeing, free living in the soil, we're also seeing different mating types with different phenotypes, which is such a, a complex world. And my point is showing you how real complex this system is. And we're going to get even more complex when we get into aromas. So 
what you're seeing here is the stars and the hearts and the triangle and the, the square are free living mycelium that we're considering as the males and they're, and they have different expressions. And then they need to get together with the females that are on the roots and then together, cause those are monocaryotes. Those are, um, I don't even want to get into that. That's too complicated. I'll be here forever. But, um, so they uh, are the two different mating types and they need to get together to make their dicaryote, the, the full tissue, the babies. And just think of like sperm and eggs, monocaryotes, and then the babies that they make are dicaryotes, just to try to simplify that. So the free living males, the females on the roots, they get together. And then this is what our thought process is currently. They make the truffle. So you see in the bottom right corner, you actually have a happy face. We finally got a truffle on that root. And we really don't know the extent of these uh, parental fertilizing agents in the soil. We're not quite clear on it yet, but Currently, our thought processes are males are free living in the soil, females are on the roots, they need to get together in order to create a truffle. So what's happening in orchards where there's no tilling or there's no movement of soil or we're not adding in more truffles into the soil is you end up with a monoculture of one mating type throughout You'll have it on the roots. You'll see it in the soil, but it's just all the same mating type. And you don't get sex if you only have females to make the babies. And so uh, we do a lot of re-inoculation efforts with um, adding spores into the soil in a very specific way to try to do our best due diligence to try to get sex to happen in these orchards. And we do that in spring, actually, right now is about the time of year we start to do that. So truffles live underground and they do not forcibly eject their spores like most of the macrofungi we see, like chanterelles and bolletes. They depend on animals to disperse their spores. So um, how exactly do they do that? Um, at, at different stages of their life cycle, truffles release specific volatiles in order to interact with very specific, uh, particular organisms. And following spore germination, truffle hyphae, uh, once the spores are in the soil, following spore germination, as the new these new free-living um, mycelium are in the soil, we see truffle hyphae foraging in the soil for food, nutrients, and eventually they'll make contact with the root of the host plant. And this will form that mycorrhization on the root. Fruiting bodies generally don't form for many years after this symbiotic uh, relationship or interaction is established. And then um, this mycelium is often eaten by insects and mammals. And then the fruiting bodies also are eaten by insects and mammals and mollusks and us and pigs and um, pretty much anything that can find it. And then this results in spore dispersal once you get that spore, particularly from a rodent or an insect or a mollusk, like a slug. Once they eat that um, truffle, then they can disperse the spores. Uh, so what we're seeing are these certain types of aromas. We have androsinols, these are your volatile organic compounds, and these are the musky uh, compounds that can manipulate behaviors. These are pheromones. And then we have the thiols in the truffles, and these are your garlic and your rotten egg aromas. The thiols are detectable at very, very small amounts. These are hydrophobic compounds they accumulate in fats. And this is what we were talking about when adding a truffle into a jar with an egg or butter or bacon, the fat content in those food items will absorb these thiols and then exhibit the garlic or this egg um, aroma when you then cook those items with the butter, if you wanna put it on toast or cook eggs with it, however, however you wanna work with that butter. And these aromas, they need to escape the soil for 
our, us humans to detect or for rodents and everything to detect. So they find their way through the soil out into the atmosphere to then attract um, through um, being out in the open. <clears throat> so here's a model of truffle volatile uh, synthesis and ecology. It's very, very complicated. Um, this diagram depicts volatile synthesis in truffles, either by the fungus itself or from very uh, various precursors, amino acids or fatty acids, or from microbes associated with truffles. And this is where we're seeing it gets even more complicated. So when the data is available um, through research, right? the potential ecological role of these volatiles in interaction with other organisms is indicated here in these little parentheses from this particular study. So what we're seeing is in, uh, in scientific literature, um, we're seeing a growing body of evidence that these volatile organic compounds that we previously thought just mediated interactions between plants and insects and, and mammals might are also interacting with plant and microbe interactions. So there's yeasts, there's bacteria, there's other filamentous fungi involved in addition to the animals coming down into the ground to dig up and eat the truffles. So what I'm saying is we need living soils, regenerative agriculture, not spraying, using biodynamic, organic, electroculture practices in our orchards. We need full living soils in order to grow truffles. All right, I'm gonna let you guys have a mind break from all of this detailed scientific data. I'm gonna give you guys a, let your minds kind of rest for a minute. It's a lot for me to say too. And then we'll get back to some complicated stuff. So let's get into the egos. How, let's have some fun. So this is the NATGA, North American Truffle Growers Association meeting in Paso Robles last year. So here we have a lot of truffle growers, people from Spain. We have people from Turkey, people from Washington, people from Oregon, and there are other people from other areas of the United States here in these photographs. And um, these are the people who are transparent and helping you be successful and organic and helping you grow truffles. So we highly encourage you guys to join the North American Truffle Growers Association to really help you get on board with making your orchards productive. We meet every year and next year we're meeting in Kentucky. Hey, we're gonna have a lot of fun. So come and join us at NATGA. There are so many other egos involved in the truffle industry. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. We have truffles coming out of Italy, Spain, France, Turkey that we that are now being um, coined as Italian white truffles, Australia, they're from all over the world. We have people on Instagram that this, this young couple, I met them in Paso Robles. This is Semolina, new and old world truffles. They just do these Instagram and TikTok uh they're, they're young millennials and they are just being very successful and they're having so much fun in they're selling truffles. So if you need to buy truffles, this is, you know, many of the people here on this screen are people who will sell you truffles. You can go to their website and you can just order them and have them shipped. Then we also have people who are going to sell you trees and we have people who are going to bring dogs to uh, sniff out your um your truffles, um, there's there's lots of ways to get into the industry. Uh, if you wanna get into the industry, I highly suggest going to the NATCA website and just joining or just scrolling through all the options. There's a lot of research there as well. Then there are these egos and these are the fun egos. You don't need a Lagoto, Lagoto Romagnolo. You don't need a Lagoto to find truffles. You need a dog who wants to work. <laughs> 
And I think actually a golden retriever is who won the Joriad this year. The Joriad is a up at the Oregon Truffle Festival. They it's an annual. Um, it's like a um, um, it's a contest to who what dog can find the most truffles. And each year, I mean, I've seen a Dachshund win. German Shepherd this year, I think a golden retriever. So you don't have to have to have, to have a fancy uh, Lagotto Romagnolo. This is a, an Italian dog that's related to the um, poodle and the Spanish water dogs. They're really good hunters. So, and they're actually used for duck hunting in Italy, also truffle hunting in Italy. Um, and then you also have down in the middle bottom, you have the rat rattlesnakes, particular here on the West Coast. So you got to watch out for those egos as well. This is my little ego. Her name is Jasper and she's an in-training Lagotto uh, truffle dog. And these are com really good companion dogs. If you're not into truffles, uh, aroma sniffing uh, training, uh, the Lagotto actually makes a really good companion dog other than just for truffles. So let me catch up with my notes. So um, we'll go into the other egos, those that are trying to eat the truffle out in the ecosystem as we start to dive into ecology. 90% um, of life lives on earth. And these systems are so complicated and we're just starting to peel off the onion of what's going on. And the smaller and deeper we look, the more we see. And being a part of truffle cultivation helps me as an arborist, as a mycologist, helps me plant trees. And that makes me to do, allows me to do my part in sequestering carbon back into soil. This allows me to take an active part in uh, regenerative agriculture, educating myself and my clients on the importance and the roles of soil ecology and allows me to apply my farming practices as best I can. I will say that education is the first step in taking an active role in understanding our small part in this very complicated web here on earth. And education never stops. Um, my biggest goal is to lower evapotranspiration rates in my orchards trapping moisture in soils. And uh, then this allows more than just growing truffles, allows rare plants and rare insects to return to farming. Stocking carbon in soils and farming mycorrhizae fungi along the way is building living soils. As I've explained and you have seen, this is a very complicated system and this we can't allow this to be a monoculture. Uh, we need to change our ideas of what agriculture is supposed to do. So creating living soils, putting back our farms with good practices, what the earth took billions of years to do uh, to create. We have just spent a few generations to undo. More photosynthesis is the key. And we just happen to be growing delicious truffles along the way. Some of us are vineyard farmers uh, in Northern California, Paso Robles, wherever you are. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of huge effort in the wine industry to do this as well with regenerative farming efforts. I have learned so much in truffle cultivation, trying to create nature in an orchard and control it as a matter of approaching problems with curiosity and openness. Um, and participating actively is my role here. And all I can say is as I, I draw kind of a mental line around myself and my world and what part I can play and a part in the action of global climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, instead of overwhelming myself and the world of all the a vast amount of issues here, I can plant trees in my local community and grow food forests for the future. And uh, growing trees with sustainability, a conscious mind, using biodynamic, electroculture, and organic practices 
is my strategy for creating more photosynthesis. And so, you know, let's plant more trees and allow these ecosystems to thrive. So forests are a study in complex systems. And in the soil, we have physical, chemical, organic. This is the foundation of forests. And the trees, the truffles, and the beasts, this is co-evolution in action. And with animals and fungi, some of them are obligate. They have to eat the truffle or though they die. They prefer to eat the truffle. That's us and pigs. And some are casually eating the truffle or the mycelium just accidentally. Um, these are all kinds of ways that truffles and mycelium fungi in general get consumed in our ecosystems. And uh, mycorrhizal respond to disturbances often creates more growth, particularly with species we know like morels. And um, mycophagy initiates and maintains truffle diversity, which is very important. Here's kind of a pictogram of the system. However, we don't have any good research that proves that if a squirrel, for example, eats a truffle and poops it out, that that creates a more viable spore dispersal or viable um, fertile spore that will then germinate. But just imagine if you eat a truffle and then it goes out the end and you leave it in this nice package with bacteria and digested other materials that can be then nutrients, that this is actually a viable way of dispersing your spores, using these aromas to attract the rodents or whatever animal to eat, and then leave it in these nice little packages to then stimulate the spores to germinate, grow, and then regenerate this system. So there's these egos, the squirrels and the rodents. They're so cute, but you know, we still have to trap them. So out in the ecos, out in the forests and natural ecosystems, there are many clues to finding truffles in nature. And there's a huge diversity out there. If you are looking for just diversity, not necessarily for the culinary table, this is a uh, a squirrel cache, and you can find these out in the forest. And you often, if you go and you dig in these caches, you'll find multiple species of truffle-like, not tuberaceae, not tuber species, but truffle-like fungi. These are hypogeus uh, gastromycetes that live in the soil. So there's a big clue right there to go. And also you'll see where other animals have been digging in the soil. And that's, um, especially this time of year up in the Sierras, um, that's a good clue where to start looking for truffles. And then we have these egos. So the Leotes beetle is well known in Europe and it can destroy a truffle crop. It does not exist in Australia, but wherever there is high productivity in truffles, the Leotes beetle tends to show up. Did the, did the eggs come across an inoculum from Europe? to Australia and then created a, a beetle, which created more beetles. Probably, I don't know for sure, for certain, but the Laodes beetle has now arrived in Australia and it is an, uh, not a native species there. And it is an issue now in the truffle culture in Australia. I'm not, con I'm not sure if it's showed up in New Zealand, but uh, we don't have it here in the United States yet. But this is a serious concern for most of us who are bringing in inoculum spores from Europe to then re-inoculate our orchards. But these guys spread the spores and in a huge way are good for the ecology of the ecosystem of our truffle culture, our truffle orchards. We also have the slugs down at the bottom and we also have the pill bugs or slaters as they call them in Australia. They, both of these can be a huge issue, especially if they are growing in high concentrations. Both of them are an indicator of good ecology, but you know, I said all this about regenerative soils and all these, uh, everything we want in the ecosystem, but some of these guys, we do have to do our due diligence to control because we are growing a crop. 
And we don't want the guys in the system that are going to destroy the crop. So then there's there's a there's a give and take with this. Um, I would love this to play and hopefully you guys can hear it. Put the worms, put the eggs close to the truffle and the worms get inside and start feeding from the truffles. So it's the, that beetle called Leodes exclusively feed from truffles. So it's it's we can see on on the wild and we will see in the orchards as well, and uh, and we will talk tomorrow about beetle and you will see in the orchards. In fact, you will see traps that we put in the orchards to catch to catch the the beetles oh. because it's it they make a big damage on the truffles. Okay, it doesn't affect the smell, but at the end it affects the quality. Mm -hmm. So even you have a golf ball, a lovely round truffle with holes, it will never be an extra truffle. Okay, so we need to control them. But at the same time, this beetle helps to propagate the spores and the males. So it's really related to highly productive orchards. So highly productive orchards has lots of beetles yeah. and, and it always arrives when the, or, when the production is going up, the beetle come with the production. So, you know, the, the beetle is definitely an, in, in, um, an aspect of, of something we need to look out for here in the United States. That's uh, Marcos Morcio. He's a, a truffle orchard um, scientist in Spain. He's a friend and he often comes to the US and gives talks and is really transparent and open and helping a lot of people bring their orchards up to uh, production. And um, here we have uh, more, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> more it goes <coughs> now we have to catch this is damage that the gophers do to the orchard you can see the teeth marks on the base of this tree they come through your orchard and they will just chew a very healthy tree down to the nubs and you can just pull that tree right out of the ground and you really have to do the best you can with trapping. People put all kinds of gases, but there are certain gases that will actually kill back mycelium that you don't want in your orchard and live trapping and just having someone in the orchard all the time trapping to remove the, the gophers is really the best way that I know of. We also do some tilling efforts that also disrupt the tunnels and you can put in owl boxes and do the best you can. There's ways you can actually run a perimeter around your orchard with uh, an underground fencing that goes below where they dig to keep them out. And um, I have known uh, Dr. Senator Briggs, who used to own an orchard up in Placerville, used to just sit out in his orchard with a gun and shoot them. <laughs> there's a lot of ways to go about this. So there's more ecology than just truffles that we want to eat. This is a cordyceps fungi uh, parasite that grows on a false truffle. And it's seen in the UK and now there's even more of this that we're uh, finding coming out with um, with uh, uh, not Michael Webb. There's there's a couple na iNaturalist. These are popping up on iNaturalist, and uh, there's some really cool ecology with truffles, other than just with the the tuber species. So this is um, one example of that. Uh, false truffles are not edible. They just aren't. They just don't taste good. Um, none of the hypogeous truffles or false truffles are reportedly uh, um, inedible or, or poisonous. But, um, you know, that goes down to the definition of what's edible. Does it taste good? Great. Um, does it not taste good? In my mind, that means it's not going to be edible because just because it doesn't make you sick doesn't mean it's edible. So this is a study done by uh, Pat O'Reilly. So I want to just take a shout out to him and thank you for um, his his photographs and the great work he's been doing on cordyceps and alaphomyces. Uh, this is, we're going to go into a study that was done in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, 
Here uh, we have uh, Lucangium carthusianum down on the bottom left. This is the organ black truffle. And then on the right, we have a uh, tuber organense, which is the organ winter white truffle. And in the top right, we have tuber uh, gibosum, which is the organ uh, spring white truffle. And then we have a guy here on the top left who's raking. I do not suggest raking the forest. What happens is you disrupt the ecology of the soil. Often people rake and don't put the duff back and they end up harvesting old truffles, young under ripe truffles, and then ripe truffles. And they just take everything. And that is definitely not ecologically correct or accepted in our community. Here is a, for the wow factor, a, a recent research project that came out that found over 65 species of truffle-like fungi. They went in and it was a one hectare sample up in the Sierra Nevadas. And um, so there's a huge species richness in um, uh, ponderosa pine stands. And this is, uh, they did mixed conifer stands. So they took this area and they did rake it because they were looking for everything. And this was done in the spring in 2002. And this was this, the list that they found. And this isn't even all of it because uh, the truffle biomass is at its biggest peak in the spring and in the fall. So in the spring after the snows melt, and then in the fall after the rains begin. So this is just a kind of a snapshot of what could possibly be as diversity out in the ecosystem, which um, I think is pretty awesome. So one question I get a lot is, what about reforestation and, and putting trees back into the soil? And so I do know of examples of Christmas tree farms up in Washington that grow a lot of um, the Oregon black truffle, Lucangium carthusianum. And this is um, actually a friend of mine's property. And he sells a lot of these to uh, Seattle, to the restaurants in Seattle. And these are, I believe, 30 plus old uh, fir trees. This is an old uh, Christmas tree farm. So this wasn't an actual regenerative effort of reforesting, but this is an example of when you just let these trees after having a Christmas tree farm grow, you, it's just natural soil, natural tree, natural truffle that's going to come from the rodents out in the natural ecosystem, and then just start creating this system. And this truffle orchard, old Christmas tree farm, here on the, the the right here on the screen, it grows truffles like it's nobody's business. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds come out of this orchard, which is, it's really awesome. This is me on the bottom in that orchard finding truffles. And then on the right here, so back in the 50s and 60s, um, the EU funded a rural development program in Spain and gave farmers land and trees to inoculate with truffles and plant to reforest Spain, many areas of Spain. This is particularly in the Teruel, Eastern outside of Barcelona region of Spain. The problem with that is once you plant the trees, you can never cut it down and replant. This is a reforesting effort. Back in the 16, 1700s, there was a lot of deforestation done by the Spanish government to create the Armada, the Spanish fleet of ships. And so this is an effort to reforest the land. What's crazy is here in the United States, when we get a couple of truffles out of our orchards, we're so excited. But here, if they harvest under a thousand pounds, or there's like, if it goes into production down to like a thousand pounds or less, they stop harvesting altogether because they get several tons a year out of their orchards, which is like, hopefully someday we'll get there, but we are, we don't have native soils, native trees and native truffles that we're trying to grow here in the U.S. in terms of tuber borchii and tuber melanosporum and tuber estivum. So we may never get to this level of production, but we are, we do have some orchards that are getting into quite a bit of hundreds of pounds of, of orchard, of truffle pounds a year, which is really, really exciting. I have about five to 10 minutes left here. So 
Um, there are other types of mycorrhizal fungi that you can inoculate on your roots, not just truffles. You can buy trees of and you can put into your orchards um, to grow food forests for the future. This is mostly in Austria, Spain, and in France, uh, eating these types of um, the suilus uh, species of bol the we call them bolates, but they're suilus, and then lactarius. In Europe, uh, these are considered highly prized uh, mushrooms to eat, and you can grow them on trees in your, in your orchards or on your land. Down in South America, there is um, a big effort going on for sequestering carbon into the soil and growing this spe specific species of lactarius that can then essentially feed, they say, millions of people. But we'll see uh, how this study goes as it progresses. So let's get into the or excuse me, the economics of truffle. Here we have tuber organins. This is the organ white truffle. This is what it looks like. This is what the spores look like. And um, this um, is kind of a clade of truffles. And it's a highly clade, meaning there's multiple species kind of locked within tuber organins. And it's a prized truffle here, as most of you, oh, there's a lot of you here from Oregon. So you are probably familiar with tuber, tuber organins. This is found uh, in mixed conifer forests. <laughs> here is the Oregon <laughs> black truffle. And look how the spores are so much different. Spores, <laughs> excuse me, and spores. Looks like little balls of carbon under the soil. So sometimes you may have found it and you didn't see it. So you just gotta be aware when you're digging in the soil. Um, so this is um, often found on Douglas fir trees. Excuse me. And then we have tuber californicum. I see this actually as a um, contamination in um, some um, orchards, specifically planted with um, uh, oak trees. I see this a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Often when you find one little tuber californicum, you can find a lot. So just look around and look at the, the spores. Very different from the other two that I just showed you. And here's an example on the bottom left of the truffle in a jar with eggs. And this is what you can do to then infuse the aromas into these items. You just pop them into a jar like this and put them in the fridge for a day or so to then infuse the, the um, <clears throat> volatile compounds into your eggs. And then there's lots of false truffles, which are fun to find. Some people really... You know, they want to find everything. And so you've got rhizopogon species, hymenogaster species. Um, there's lots of different uh, species of false truffles, as you saw in that Sierra Nevada study. And then here, let's get into the truffles that we want to eat. We have tuber magnatum on the top, number one. Number two, we have tuber melanosporum. Number three, tuber estivum. Number four, Tuber borkii, which a lot of people are finding um, very much easier, less picky to grow. I, I like to coin it as is like a Zinfandel or a Merlot. It's easier. It's not as picky. And where like tuber melanosporum is more an estivum is more like a Pinot Noir. You can grow it, but it's, it's a little bit more trickier to get the right soil conditions to grow. Uh, number five is tuber brumale. And uh, this is a truffle we don't necessarily want to grow, but I have eaten it and I actually enjoyed tuber brumale. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then there's at the very bottom tuber macrosporum, which is not really one that we popularly are growing, but it is another that we, we can. No, what's not shown here is tuber indicum, which is the Chinese truffle, which are is often sent to us um, and it has is a contamination. We consider it a contamination. It really doesn't have any aroma. And so um, it's considered a contamination. <clears throat> it doesn't have a lot of economic value. Here in Spain, again, is my hand. And in one 45 minute uh, of just hunting, we found the burgundy truffle, which is a steamum. We found a summer truffle, which is technically also a steamum. 
bromelae, and melanosporum. Tuber estivum, which is the summer burgundy truffle. You can see the spores there. They look like little soccer balls. And this truffle has beautiful mycorrhizae, beautiful cystidia, which are specialized cells that come off the roots of the trees. And what you see on hyphae that are or mycelium, hyphae is like a single mycelium thread is a hyphae. And what you see on the tips of the roots is very specific physiology. So it's like a thumbprint. So when you look under the microscope, especially with the spores and then on the tips of the roots and then the, the, the tissue, you can actually smash the mushroom tissue, the fungal tissue, and you can actually see very specific anatomy. And this helps us to identify uh, the truffles we have on the roots in the orchards. And then we can also use DNA analysis to, um, to figure that out, make sure we have it or don't. This goes for about $800 a pound, tuber estibum, and it's successfully being grown here in the United States. Tuber borki, again, very specific anatomy on the roots, uh, on the cystidia, on the that mycelium I showed you on the scanning electron micrograph. And this is a delicious truffle. It has a lot of garlic and floral aromas, and, and it's a little less picky to grow. And it goes for about $600 a pound. And the pricing ranges depending on the quality. If you've got bugs or slugs or not, or it's just a perfect truffle. And it's really hard to get a perfect truffle out of the ground. A tuber melanosporum, again, has very specific 90 degree angle cystidia that are coming out of the, the roots of the tips of the trees. And um, the plantankama is a, a long term, but the plain tankama is the term for the tissue of that um, hartig net or that sock on the tip of the root of the tree. Very specific anatomy. And um, in it, it's what a lot of people want to grow because it fetches a much higher price. Some people can get up to $1,800 a pound, depending on the, the demand in the market. And I, you know, I firmly believe that growing truffles here on U.S. soil and selling U.S. grown truffles to our chefs is really going to help with the economics. And here we have the, the white alba truffle, tuber magnanum from Italy. We have not figured out yet how to grow it here, but it goes for about $2,600 a pound. The, uh, and it's also delicious. It's similar to tuber borkii. It is a white truffle and it has more of those thiols, which is that garlic, that floral aroma. The most expensive truffle in the world is tuber magnatum, which went for $330,000 at an auction. And I believe recently one went for even more than that. So in cultivating truffles, it can cost you between $10,000 and $35,000 an acre, depending on what infrastructure you already have. And you can expect about $40,000 a year with, with production or less. And, and I don't think our industry is in the US is quite there yet. There's a lot of truffle growers on this, on this chat, on this um, webinar today that can tell you that they're not making $40,000 a year. It really is a project labor of love. But there are some orchards that are starting to get to a production level where they are actually getting a return on their investment. And so that is where we're at and showing, um, how viable as an economic crop this really can be. And the more we learn, the better we get at growing these truffles. So you can see the biggest producers of truffles in the world here. And the US is still, we're just not quite there, but I'll tell you in Australia and New Zealand, not native truffle, not native plant with the native soil, that combination, they have really figured out the, the magic secret sauce to getting that to work. And we are, we are working on that um, here in the U.S. Now I'm pretty much out of time. Trent, do you want to chime in here? I'm gonna escape this. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Oh, that took me a ahead. second there. I mean, yeah. I I have a million more slides, but I think we're kind of we're kind yeah. of at the. Uh, I can yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have some questions too. Yeah, let me just do one more. Uh, okay. Let me go back to this slideshow thing. I'm so sorry, everybody. No, do one more and I'll get the yeah. questions ready to feed to you in just a minute. 
Yeah, I okay. Oh gosh. No, I have <laughs> all the way through everything. Let me just do this really quick. There's two more slides here. Holy geez. I don't know how to go to the end. <laughs> Bear with me, everybody. <clears throat> We're almost there. Almost. Why isn't it going? There we go. So in Europe, there's a lot of money in truffle products. And this is a huge issue we are addressing with the North American Truffle Growers Association. And you can see on the bottom left, doesn't that look like olives? And there's a lot of products that are mixed with olives. Olives have very similar thiols and they give the same a similar aromas to truffles. And so they're often mixed with truffles or used as black specks in truffle products that are then imported to the United States and labeled with truffle product, with truffle, with natural truffle, with natural truffle aroma. And none of it has any truffle. In it. Some of it has truffle in it. And you can actually take a sample, look at it under a microscope and see the spores but if it doesn't have spores, there's no truffle in it, especially these things with these false aromas, with false advertising on the label. So this is a huge issue we are um, trying to address. They just mix it all together, put it in a top and nod and send it to the US. Hey, can so, I jump in there on that yes. note? Because there's a question on that topic before yeah. you hop to this next slide. It's from Sarah Colby. She says, uh, can you speak on established or needed food production systems for infused foods to sell commercially, oil, cheese, nuts, salt, et cetera, especially as related to Oregon natives. Yes, absolutely. I think there's a huge market for it. And I just think that we need to establish correct labeling regulations so that things are labeled correctly. I mean... I mean, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, I think there's a there's a huge market for it, for sure. Did you have another slide you want to hit here before we continue with questions? All right. Well, I, I got quite a few queued up and there'll probably be more coming in. Uh, yeah. Just like to give a friendly reminder to everybody, we opened up this webinar to uh, members and non-members. And if you're a non-member, please consider joining NAMA. I think we had a special offer for $25. We are a nonprofit. Um, I'm a volunteer. We do a lot of education. We spend a lot of our budget on scholarships. We do uh, DNA testing. We support vouchering. Uh, we, we're doing a lot and we really could use your support. So please, please join us and support our mission as well. Yes. Um, let's yep. hit a couple science questions up here yeah. um, from earlier on. One is question is from Martin Osis. Is the female slash male mycorrhiza model the same for other fungal species? Sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. I had people come yeah. into my Is the female slash male mycorrhiza model the same for other fungal species? Well, it depends on the species. Some species have very, very complex mating type systems that include more than just a male and a female. So on a chalkboard, we often use pluses and minuses, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus. And it gets even compli more complicated than that. For example, Schizophyllum commune has, I believe, 36 different mating types and armillaria, which there are in another species complex, it's actually parasitic fungi, parasitic fungi, uh, armillaria. Um, that has a, a lot of mating types. I'm, I don't want to misquote, but I think it's over 100. And if you think about it, having more mating types when you do spore dispersals allows you more viability to find a mating type in the craziness of the forest. Because once you go out in the forest, someone's trying to eat you, whether you're a plant or a fungus or an insect, someone out there is trying to eat you the instant you hit that forest floor. So whether you're a spore, mycelium, or a fruiting body. So um, the mating types is, is very, very complex. What we know about truffles is there's basically two, but then there's also phenotypes involved, which also makes it harder for um, for some of these uh, mating types to actually mate. And then they have to find each other in the soil also. So that makes it really complicated. Thank you. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think that was great. Um, 
now we have more, the questions are growing. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the first one, of course, an anonymous person asked about invasiveness and said, uh, what, are the, what are the risks for an invasive species event, either directly uh, through imported truffles or indirectly? And uh, it's always, he says, or she says, it's always jarring to me to read about the issues with mycorrhizal invasives from tree plantations, and then hear about people seeking to mass move some truffle species from one continent to another. Well, there is an issue with tuber indicum coming in to the U.S. And we don't see it on a, on a big level yet, but definitely if you are trying to grow one species of truffle, you don't want an invader coming in and taking over the root space. If you look at a tree and you look at all of its root state space, you look at it like real estate. And if all that real estate is taken up by an invader or something that you don't want growing there, then that's definitely an issue because that lowers your production. And so with, with growing, uh, say, tuber melanosporum, we do a lot of DNA analysis in our truffle orchards, which is really important to prove that not just with microscopy, but proving that what you're growing is what you what you say you're growing is actually what you are growing and selling to to your chefs. So um, it's definitely an issue, and yeah. you have to just be do do your due diligence, and you have to be wary about who comes into your orchard. I know some orchard owners make people wear their rubber boots and then also still go through a bleach bath before they even let you out into their orchards. So they're really, um, you know, they have tall fences. They're secretive about where they even have these orchards because they don't want to get contamination inside. And Karen Bell had a question on that about the blue boot cover she saw in the picture. Is that is that is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's trying. So we don't know where these shoes have been globally. People are coming from all over the world to to see this one particular orchard down in Paso Robles, and you don't know what's on the on the on your shoes. So you don't want that going out into your orchard and contaminating. So we all put on those blue booties to um, keep our dirt out. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Colby asks: Is there a special technique for reinoculation for native truffles? For native truffles. So in terms of like, uh, okay, that truffle, that uh, Christmas tree farm, that was not inoculated on purpose. That just happened organically. And you, what I know Paul Stamets is working on in uh, a big reforestation project up in, um, in BC, British Columbia, up in Victoria Island uh, with fir trees. So you have to have the native uh, fir tree and then uh, Lucangium, and you can, you know, you can go harvest Lucangium and you can make these, you know, uh, spore slurry milkshakes. And as the trees are germinating, get those two to start talking to each other. And then you look under the microscope and you do DNA checking and you can see that this is inoculated correctly. And the roots want to be on those germinated spores. And there's materials you can use in the nurseries and temperature regimes you use in the nurseries to get these things to really gel well to with each other. And they grow in the nursery for a couple of years and then they go out into your orchard or forest reforestation uh, area. So I think more of this can happen with, uh, with um, reforesting areas of Oregon and Washington. I think, I think this could be a real economic viable crop for the forestry service overall, for sure. Okay, uh, Krista, I really like her question. Um, she said, you mentioned the truffles find their way to the surface. Uh, how? Uh, uh, she would assume primarily by being dug up by animals, but is there another way? She said she's picturing crawling truffles. That's hilarious. Uh, I was talking about the organic volatile aromas. Uh, okay, not the truffle from. itself. Got you. Right, they need the, or the aroma. So the truffle... Mm -hmm itself is giving off these aromas and they have to find their way to the surface to get out and then attract the because the animals are are on the like crawling across the ground or they're tunneling through and they, they so the aromas have to get through the soil in order to get out away from the truffle to attract these animals for for eating so it's it's so you can imagine aromas you know just like think of smoke in the air they have to make their way through the soil. And um, that's a complex system into itself. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have a couple of related questions. Um, 
uh, lightly related. I'm going to just go in order here. Jenny asked, do you know uh, anyone growing troubles in the Northeast? How successful is it there? And have you heard of any feedback or on jumping worms impacting uh, truffle growing? Jumping worms are obviously a pretty scary, invasive creature. I am not familiar with jumping worms. You won't forget them after you see one. I'm going to find out. I, I've, no, I've, I haven't had all the, the meetings I've been to and symposiums and stuff. Jumping worms on fungi or on truffles? They're in forests and, and backyards and uh, invading, especially in suburban areas through mulch. And they wreak havoc on the, the dirt. Uh, where so, are these jumping worms from? I don't know, but I know they're finding them in the Midwest. And, and you know, I think uh, you have to be careful importing or bringing in uh, mulch into your yard because you can introduce this, this species. Um, it's pretty interesting. They're, they're really weird when you see them. They, they jump and they're kind of creepy. Like I said, education never stops. So um, how fabulous I get to learn, go down this rabbit hole learning all about jumping worms. First of all, I'm thinking of a worm with legs, like little springs jumping. Like how does it? You know, it just twists and it moves so fast and it's worm-like fashion. It pops off the ground like it, hop, huh. it, it hops. It's weird. What about the What about the Northeast though? Are there any successful truffle? Um, There's successful in the truffle cultivation. I think we're going on eight states. So you've got Kentucky, Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina. That's just on the East Coast that I can just go off my hand. California. Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Um, there's there's a lot of truffle efforts all over the U.S. and very very successful. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm pulling this one from the chat from Cornelia. Um, yeah. Cho asked, uh, "What species of trees have truffle borchii been grown oh, on?" Successfully? I didn't really go over the tree species. Um, I need to add that in there's so much to talk about. So Borky can grow on multiple species of oaks. Uh, we grow them on stone pine uh, trees uh, and then also on hazelnuts, uh, the European cultivar of hazelnuts, Coralana, Coralinus avalana. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, related really here. Make, uh, sorry, you can really make a beautiful diversity of different tree species in your orchard. You can use linden trees, multiple different oaks, hazelnuts, uh, purple hazelnuts. There's curly hazelnuts, and um, and then also with uh, the stone pine, which becomes a really beautiful uh, pine tree that you can also get the pine nuts off of. Okay. Hey, you might have to rattle off to answer this question again, the, the eight states, but the question is too about trees. I know a number of scrub, this is from Donna Kurt. Thank you, Donna. I know a number of scrub oak trees that are natural old growth. I'm expecting it is possible there are truffle species associated with them, but I wonder if they're edible. Is it possible to search for them? This is in central Canada where we get three to four months of very cold weather, minus 20 degrees Celsius. Goodness. So I would definitely keep your eye out for any rodents out there digging in the spring once that snow melts off and that soil starts to warm up to, you know, at least like 50 degrees. I'm sure your soil at some point warms up. It's not just a total permafrost. I'm not from Canada, so I'm not so familiar, but uh, I, I, again, don't like say to rake, but there, you can actually go out there and rake back the duff. I would suggest putting it back when you're done, but it's on your land. You can definitely go out there and look. You can also smell the soil, see if it's got any truffle aroma, if you're familiar with the different aromas of truffles. And um, that's what I would suggest on your property. If you have, uh, you know, different oak species, and uh, they definitely grow lots of different species of truffles for sure. And you might find other hypogeus um, gastromycetes there as well. Uh, I'm going to ask my own totally unrelated question right here. Uh, you could be like Nicolas Cage too and smell them out. Uh, any comments on the, the Nicolas Cage movie about truffles? Oh, pig. I, oh, I enjoyed it. Although I, I really uh, yeah. wanted him to take a bath the whole movie. <laughs> I've seen it a couple of times. I really thought it was a great avant-garde film and um, I just feel bad for the pig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's cleaner than the pig is cleaner than Nicolas Cage. It was a really beautiful movie on mm -hmm. on flavors nice. and food and relationships. Mm -hmm. And it was it wasn't really about uh, finding truffles at all. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Bad personally. movie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like okay, Nicolas right. Cage. He's back important. to the. <laughs> back to the back to the topic at hand here. Uh, Donna, uh, uh, boy, Donna's asking an, <laughs> an interesting question. If truffles are being eaten on our tables and then defecated down our urban toilets, this does this not impact availability of spores back into the regenerative soils? Well, is that do you, are you using a decomposing toilet and then putting that out into your organic garden? That, that would be like one she's way to flushing it down the toilet. Yeah. Yeah, because that's going to go into the sewer system and then it's going to a bacteria bath to then eat up that material. And then, you know, we're recycling uh, water issues within your your county municipal water system. So that's not actually going to get those truffle spores into the environment to grow. So unfortunately, I would have to say no to that. But if you had like a decomposting toilet at your house and you were pooping in that toilet and then using that to go into your garden compost, possibly. Maybe. Okay. Well, try it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, uh, anonymous question. What can be done to support small forest landowners to encourage reforestation? I pay 15% of harvest to landowners. What else? You know, that is a, another loaded yeah. question. I, yeah. I think, you know, if you want to uh, reforest your land that's been deforested, uh, you would have to set up a greenhouse system and you'd have to go collect those um, those nuts or acorns or whatever tree you want to use to, um, or pine cones, whatever you want to use to reforest your land and then figure out through, you know, doing research or reading other people's research, how to germinate those nuts and, and um, tree fruits and then, you know, go collect truffles. You can buy them. You probably want to DNA analyze them to make sure that you're actually using the correct species of truffle. And then, you know, it's it's not brain surgery how to get the truffle onto the roots of a germinating tree. So it just takes trial and error. Like any mushroom farm you build, you know, it's always trial and error and learning. And it's uh, basically there's are many these are many mushroom farms out in nature that we are creating. So uh, there's, yeah. there's, there's definitely research out there that you can go read and learn and then do it for yourself on your own property. Yeah, it's not really an answer to that question, but I imagine any time you can find a way for people to monetize their land and through planting trees, whether it's a tax break or, or something else offers another, another reason for, for people to do it potentially. Hey, you know what? Growing trees, planting trees on your property always does a few things. One is increase your property value. Two, you can grow food forests for your future generations. Three, it builds the ecological system of your land. And that is like the best positive attribute you can give to your property is putting in trees to give more place for the birds and the bees and all of the other organisms to thrive. Yep. Uh, truffle oil, how do I know if it's real? That is a loaded question. You you don't. You can you can uh, look at it under the microscope and try to find some spores. Um, if it's from Europe and it just says natural truffle aroma on it, it probably isn't. If you don't see any pieces of actual truffle in there, some even is false truffle oil with pieces of truffle in there. And so this is the problem that we have currently. Correct regulations that force producers to put the right labeling on the bottles and the jars that say what's in it. You know, in the uh, functional mushroom industry, we have to go through FDA regulations. We can't say a lot of, we can't even mention certain diseases on labels when with functional mushrooms. And we are regulated to the teeth with what we can and cannot say. And it's just bad business what is happening in the truffle oil industry. And don't get me on that soapbox because I'll just start going off. Yeah. <laughs> and I know uh, there are other people here from, from the truffle industry that are just probably, you know, saying it's stuff because it's a problem. It's a it's huge problem. 
Yeah, I, I hate oh, going no. out to restaurants that's... and they serve you truffle fries and you're like, no, that's come probably... on. Unless the, the chef bought a truffle and fused it in oil and then used that on the fries within the last 24, 48 hours. It's not real no. truffle fries. No, it fell off the Cisco truck and they dumped some oil, some chemicals on it probably. Yeah. But it's definitely a huge problem. So I, I think just to reiterate, oh, anything yeah. we can do to support really food labeling is really the solution to a lot of these, these problems that's, that surround this, whether you're a consumer or a producer. Absolutely. Uh, food labeling would, would really help us all out. Um, and same thing with mushrooms too. I mean, across, it, this goes beyond simply truffle, simply truffles. Um, Lisa has an interesting question. She said, can you give me a brief description of electroculture? It was mentioned oh, several before. times. Electroculture goes back before the, um, I'm so glad someone asked about electroculture. It's uh, before you go, there's a second question too from Krista about possible lightning tie-in. So if you could talk about lightning as part of that. Yes, this is, you know, electricity coming from the atmosphere. So electroculture uh, is we build antennas and we bring in certain metals like coppers and steel and magnets into our um, farming system that allows these atmospheric ions to come into the soil and creates this little ion sphere on your farm that allows more fertility in the soil, more bioavailable um, nutrients that then can be shuttled into your plants through water, nutrient uptake, mycorrhizal fungi associations, and you actually grow larger fruit. So if you're growing potatoes, squash, tomatoes, you actually get bigger, more vibrant plants and bigger, more vibrant fruits. And I have been um, experimenting. If you go to my Pacific Truffle Growers YouTube page, you'll see there's a few videos in, in there of me doing electroculture um, experiments in one of my truffle orchards. I'm having fun with it. It's, it's woo woo, but, uh, I haven't seen any like strong results, but definitely I did these, um, these coils of the, on the base of this one row of trees. And that particular row of trees grew just expansion exponentially a lot bigger. And then that, and that springtime, it was, this was last year I did that. And those trees are just, that row of trees is just slightly bigger than the other rows. Is that an accident? Is that because the vigor in the soil? Is it because I put these electro, these copper wires around the base? Um, I like to think it was the copper wire. So it's these things you, in your own system, own farm, you got to redo them to see that you, you know, regenerate the results so that you can actually like say, okay, I'm pretty confident that what I did there in electroculture actually worked. I'm going to do it again over here. So um, there's a lot of information. There's bad information and good information about everything, right? But electroculture is one of them. And there's a lot of people in Europe that are farming with uh, antennas and electroculture techniques that um, seem to be really working in terms of a uh, farming uh, vegetable crops for your own family. You know, you can do it on a small scale with your, with your veggies. It's kind of awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, Ian asks, what would be the best way to get started growing truffles casually on trees you already have? Ooh, this goes back to where I mentioned the roots of the trees. Think of it as real estate and, um, you only have so much real estate available and a tree that's already been in your uh, system, in your farm, on your land for a long period of time, it's going to have other fungi, endomycorrhizae, ectomycorrhizae attached to it. So it's really hard to get an already existing tree to then up, like attach its roots to new mycorrhizae. Now, each spring when you grow new feeder roots, those are like new roots that are available. So if you have the spores, if you can inject those spores in the soil right where that is, you may get a positive outcome, but um, that's an expensive effort. So I know there are a lot of people who do this with chanterelle and bolete slurries on their trees um, around their houses to try to get bolets and chanterelles. And people say it works, but there's no real evidence so um, if you have the means to experiment, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got two mycological type questions. The first one from Martin is a follow-up. So he's asking, uh, is the initial mycorrhiza on the root is a monochiron question? Monochiron. You, you, uh, say that again? 
Yeah. So the initial mycorrhiza on the root is a mono chiron. Mono carrion. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So when a spore germinates mm -hmm. and that hyphae grows, it's a monokaryote. Think of sperm and egg. So it only has half of the amount of DNA tissue to make a, um, a gamete that is then uh, able to reproduce and create uh, fruiting bodies. So on in terms of mushrooms, it's just mushrooms like 101, a spore, a spore germinates and grows. Those are monokaryons, mono meaning half of or one. So, and then it grows and those will find each other in nature. They will fuse. And then from there will grow a new dikaryotic tissue. Di meaning two, it's got both parts of the gametes in their nuclei. And then from there you can get a primordia, which then grows a fruiting body, which then creates more spores. The spores are monokaryons. So that's just like life cycle 101. Same with humans, right? Like all my tissue is dikaryotic, but as soon as I create an egg, that's a monokaryon. And then a sperm comes along, those fuse, and that becomes a dikaryon. That's just basic uh, life cycle biology 101. And I know you, you mentioned this before, but to clarify, this, this is not true for all uh, fr fruiting body producing mushrooms, or is it? Is, is this, yes, is this all relationship for is all? Yeah. So, okay. It's complicated, but dikaryotic tissue can grow free living vegetative state in the environment until it gets the right environmental conditions. Then it will maybe hopefully create a primordia, which is a baby mushroom and then grow a mushroom. A mushroom is actually a shape, a cap and stem, but uh, not all fungi are mushrooms, but all mushrooms are fungi. So, um, yeah, so monokaryons can grow free living in the soil, mate, create a dikaryotic tissue, and that can grow free living in the soil as well. Okay. So like here on a mushroom farm, we test our cultures to see if they're monokaryons and dikaryons, because we also are trying to grow fruit bodies, which are dikaryotic tissue. And that's what we want for getting, you know, in functional mushrooms, we get um, certain nutrients out of the mycelium and certain nutrients out of the fruiting body. We want all of it together to get the most um, effectiveness out of it as possible. And so um, you can get a little bit of both in nature. Gosh, I hope mm -hmm. I answered that question. So if you were if you were in a, in a lab in space and you had one spore, you couldn't actually uh, grow it into a, a fruiting body. You, you would need another spore to create, to create the, the spores, mycelial... Yes. And, they, and we do actually see spores floating in space. Interesting. They do make their way to space or they came from outer space to earth. Who knows? <laughs> um, Heidi says, I am confused on spores versus fruiting bodies. I thought truffles were the fruiting body, not inclusive of spores. In your presentation, I believe you showed spores under the microscope from the fruiting body. Can you please confirm? That's correct. So a fruiting body of fungi contains the hymenophore. The hymenophore is the spore bearing material on a fruiting body of a fungi. So if you see like a, a mushroom, a cap and stem, you can either have teeth, gills, pores, or tubes. And those are the hymenophore of those different styles of making mushrooms. Um, on a gasteromycete, these are the stomach fungi. These either grow on the soil surface like puffballs or hypogeus under the earth. Inside, so you have the exoperidium, which is the skin. Uh, here's an apple. So the exoperidium, which is the skin on the outside. If I were to slice this open, you're going to see seeds inside because this is an apple. If it was a, a truffle or a puffball, I would slice it open and you would see the skin. And then you would see all this tissue inside, which then once it's mature, actually turns into a powder and, and puffballs, turns into like a a goopy glop in truffles. And that is just trillions and trillions of spores. If I were to cut this, if this was a ripe truffle, and I was going to cup it open, smear it on my face, I would have a big black smear of just a billion spores on my face. So awesome. the inner guts of a truffle is all spores, which is why when you take truffles and you make a sauce or you make a oil, 
and then you take that and look at it under the microscope, you're going to see spores. So if it's a false oil, you won't see spores. If it's got bits and pieces like truffle chips, if you see bits and pieces of black, take that black bit and put it under a microscope. If you don't see spores, it's going to be probably an olive, which doesn't have spores. Oh, you got me on my soapbox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask two more questions. We're kind of out of time. Okay. Um, um, and um, maybe just one. One of them is just this home run question. Again, like cue it up, get ready to hit this hard. Okay. Um, some I oils, et cetera, have synthetic truffle essence. What do you think of this? Is it better to avoid it? And Joe says, all of the truffle oil I've seen for sale smells like old socks to me. I understand that real truffle oil is nearly impossible to find in the U.S. markets. So a little bit about, a little more about that topic, please. Yeah, so a synthetic truffle oil, once you get familiar with it, you actually, I, I have cr created an aversion to it. It mm -hmm. kind of gets my because I get irritated. So it gives me a stomachache. And I know people who have experimented with false truffle oil and um, they just can't even stand it now. Um, say more about that question again. Uh, is it, and the second part from Joe was, Brant was about, uh, is it hard to find real truffle oil in the, in the US market? Oh, yeah, I believe it is. Um, so I have found uh, specialty food items at different specialty stores. And I like, like to take them because I have three microscopes at home. And I just like to pop them on a slide and look at them under. And if they have spores, and I'm like, you know what? I can invest my my money in this. in this Because uh, it, if it says tuber melanosporum on the label, like it actually calls out the, the truffle that it's from likely it's actually going to have that in it because who's going to call out a, a fungus they put on their label, but then be totally false about it. Like that's really shady business. So I, I feel that the majority of truffle products that actually say the species that's in there is going to have a piece of it in there. Um, I can't say to the quantity or quality or accurateness of that it's it's really a big issue and i i agree with you it's hard to find real truffle oil so i'm from napa valley we have thomas keller we've got all these famous chefs and you go to these great restaurants and whatever city you're in and if they have truffles on the menu and they come and shave it or they haven't and then you know they have truffles in the kitchen and they're and they have a truffle oil item and you can ask that chef hey did you make that truffle oil is it like with real truffle and if the sh if the waiter doesn't know probably not but if the waiter's like hey yeah we got this in from this provider blah 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 likely yes that's real truffle oil and I know a lot of chefs, particularly in the Napa area, Sonoma County area, they make their own truffle oil in house. They use it on, they make butters, they freeze it, they use it year round. And, and it's a, it's a process that they go through to make sure that their truffle products on their menu are actual truffles. And I know this is the same in New York, Dallas, these, you know, Chicago is a huge foodie town, uh, Miami, a lot of these big chefs that come out of these big chef schools are like really big on making sure that they can back up the products that they are feeding you in their restaurants. Yeah, it seems like a lot of, you know, maybe not these chefs you're talking about, but there's still a lot of people around the, the country that, you know, see truffle oil and don't really understand that there's there's a, a fake product out there that's, that's rampant. And the people that get it really get it. They tell you, this is, here's the truffle and here, here's the origin of that truffle. And, oh, and, yeah. and you're going to watch me shave it onto your food in the restaurant yeah, or it gets talked about. Yeah, it is. It's important enough that people that know, know, and they will tell you um, uh, that it's real. But on that note, we've been going 90 minutes. Hey. Um, I'm sorry for the few questions we didn't get to. Um, yeah, nice. uh, we did our best. You can reach out to me. Um, oh, I should put my email on here. Pacific truffles at gmail.com. Pacific truffles with an S on the end at gmail.com. And if you have uh, questions that are just burning, uh, you want answered, please feel free. And you can also find me on YouTube, Pacific Truffles on YouTube. And I have a, a website, 
pacifictruffles.com. So feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much for, for spending uh, your afternoon with, with all of us here at NAMA and, and, and uh, helping us learn more about your passion. We, we appreciate your, your, your effort in this today. Absolutely. Thank you, Trent. I really appreciate you having me here and I appreciate NAMA for having me here and all the other mycological societies that have really helped shape me into the passionate mycologist that I am. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great day, everyone.